it, while I was at university in, in 1973, 1974, uh, I started to compile this book. And I thought, wow, the, the exploits, the, the, the sheer incredible ingenuity that cavers bring to bear to find these places is, is a story well worth listening to. It was reading Martin Fire's book that first inspired me to make a television series about cave diving. Over my many years as a caver and a filmmaker, I'd been lucky enough to know and to meet many of the most significant cave diving pioneers. Anything which they had in their showroom, we could borrow. And what they had in their showroom were copper hard hats and <laughs> punks. <laughs> and, well, do you think I was going to turn down such a good offer as that? No, I found a cave which was big enough to take the equipment. <laughs> I've got this memory of thinking that it's been broken and, and fallen to the ground all around me. Cave diving has reached astonishing new levels and has finally become recognised as being at the cutting edge of the exploration of our planet. The technical advances and their consequent discoveries have been astonishing. In 2017, Martin updated his book. It's now also time for me to update the story. British cave divers have mostly been cavers that turned to diving to try to pass the sums that brought exploration to an end. British sums bring their own special challenges. They are often restricted with poor visibility. When my original filming ended in 1989, many sites which had not yet reached some physical blockage needed new techniques and new technology to push on further. Where a way ahead did lay open, there could be two additional limitations, dive duration and depth. So there are all manner of complications involved with depth. You need more gas, you need to be thermally protected against the cold water. So you need very often to be wearing a dry suit rather than a wet suit. You need to be aware of the afflictions that can come your way like nitrogen narcosis and most certainly decompression issues. And decompression issues are present on every single dive underwater. At that time, commercially, the amount of decompression was determined according to how much time was spent at what depth using decompression tables. The problem was that cave diving was not straight up and down, as was mostly the case in open water, but a much more complex profile determined by the cave passage. Then a useful piece of technology appeared in the form of the first wearable decompression meter. In 1982, Martin Farr was the first to use one to push the deep sump that he had reached at the upstream limit of Wookie Hole. Well, this thing continually or constantly monitors what the diver is doing underwater. It gives a dive time here uh, in minutes when you're underwater, and then when you get out to the other side, it tells you how much residual nitrogen you've got left in your body. Uh, it gives a constant readout of your depth. It tells you... Um, the first decompression depth that you need to stop at and the length of time that you need to stop at that depth. He reached a depth of 60 metres, a new British depth record. But the return to the surface would take two and a half hours, with two anxious one hour decompression stops in zero visibility. Then, following the advice of Royal Navy divers who needed further above water decompression and to spend a night camping in chamber 25, before he could emerge to a champagne reception. Had Martin gone deeper, particularly in the cold cave water, he could well have faced the second danger of deep diving, nitrogen narcosis. Air is made up of three well-known component parts, the major component of which is nitrogen. 
and 79% of the air we breathe is nitrogen. All bar a tiny fraction, the other 21% is oxygen, which we all think is the all-important gas for breathing. Think about the nitrogen, this major part of the gas that we're breathing. With depth, strange things happen to it, and it is absorbed by the body tissues, via the lungs, into the blood, into the tissues. It's absorbed into the body very slowly, and we don't even know it's there. But if you're coming back out from a long and certainly from a deep dive, we must come back in a very slow, careful manner, certainly when we're making our ascent. Because if we come up too rapidly, that nitrogen in the body tissues can come back into the blood supply in a very dramatic way, just like if you've shaken a bottle of Coke and you unscrew the top and bubbles come flying out. That's a bit over the top as an example, but just imagine that on a smaller scale happening in your blood circulation. This, this issue becomes known as the bends. In 1985, Rob Parker was doing tests in a compression chamber, breathing a gas mixture used in industry and known as Trimix. It's called Trimix because by reducing the amount of the two main atmospheric gases, they are supplemented by non-toxic helium. This mix guarantees safety from nitrogen narcosis and helps maintain complete clarity of thought. My friend Rob Parker took himself to America, to the Floridian cave diving scene, uh, and there he got to use the magical gas that people were talking about, Trimix, which is a mixture of helium, nitrogen, and oxygen. And using this gas for the first time in Britain, Rob passed my limit in Wookiee Hole and went down to 68 meters depth in 1985. Having supported Martin on his record break in Wookiee Hole Dive, he felt he could use this technology to push Wookiee deeper. It will need a highly planned, complex operation involving several nights camped in the far reaches of the cave. Unfortunately, he was to find that only eight metres deeper than the point that Martin had reached, there was an impassable constriction filled with gravel and with strong currents blocking the way forward. Although the new record of 68 metres was a bit of a disappointment, it had clearly opened the door for further Trimix diving. What this means is it allows divers to spend longer and go to much greater depths and it's reducing some of the problems we've had with decompression up to now. And on a world scale, people are going to be swimming miles into cave systems as opposed to just a few kilometres. How right he would prove to be. Elsewhere in Europe, it was already happening. This is the Fontaine de Vaucluse, the biggest rising in France. Sites like this offered easy access, had good visibility and large unrestricted passages. In 1981, four years before Palka's Wookiee dive, this man, German diver Jochen Hassenmeyer, had arrived here at night with no permission to dive and supposedly only his wife for assistance. Earlier attempts to discover what lay below the water surface had all been limited by the equipment available. With standard equipment, they could only reach 30 meters while two expeditions by a team led by Jack Cousteau with his aqualungs reached a depth of 74 metres. Then they tried an unmanned machine. The unwieldy Telenor reached 106 metres before it was stopped by a ledge. The shaft continued down. Hasenmeyer was ahead of his time. He not only developed and adapted his own complex equipment, but to achieve greater depth, he was already diving with a helium gas mix that he had formulated himself. 
He calculated that he would need long decompression stops. In addition to four 20-litre bottles across his back, he towed another five on a sledge behind him to use on his slow return to the surface. That year in 1981, he managed a depth of 140 metres, far deeper than had been reached before, and the bottom was still out of sight. Not satisfied, he would return in 1983 and reach an astonishing depth of 200 metres, over 650 feet. Only robotic underwater submersibles could go deeper. Eventually, the Mondexa would reach the bottom. At 308 metres, it photographed a slope of rubble leading to a passage leading off, and still unexplored. The dives at Vaucluse were far from Hasselmeyer's only technical contribution. The same year as his first dive there, he was also experimenting at the Emergence du Ricel in central France, which has since become one of Europe's classic cave diving sites. He was using a revolutionary closed circuit double rebreather system that he built himself to make a solo dive reaching a distance of 1,755 metres from base with a maximum depth of 70 metres. Hasenmeyer was to do many notable dives, but the one that he would be most remembered for was a picturesque rising in southern Germany and known as the Blautopf. In 1985, he was to make an extraordinary solo dive here. He was photographed with his huge array of equipment. This time, he was using an open circuit with his four-cylinder, four-valve jumbo backpack. An underwater scooter would be used to speed his progress against the current and to preserve both air and energy. But not only that, he would film himself. Apart from a small 8mm handheld camera, he towed a sledge, on which was mounted a perspex housing containing another camera modified to be fed from a large 1000 foot roll of 8mm film, giving a one hour duration. He could operate the camera and lights from a control bar in front of him. Wo der Quellstrom das Geröll heraus weht, schalte ich meine Akkus ein, prüfe nochmal die Kamera, das Licht. Dann, das sehen wir die letzte Forelle, die in Blautop gelebt hat. Inzwischen ist sie leider den Weg alles irdischen gegangen. Diese Aufnahmen sind noch von einem zweiten Höhlentaucher gemacht, der mich 30 Meter in den Berg hinein begleitet hat. As ever, he would dive unsupported, other than another diver to film him during the early stages. Having made four previous dives here, the passage was rising, and he now felt breakthrough was imminent. Das ist gerade eine Überraschung. Unter Wasser. Bei 1250 Meter. Das habe ich nicht erwartet. Äh, die Überraschung. Nach 100 Metern. Tropfsteine. Unter Wasser. In drei Meter Wassertiefe. Dass sie trocken gelegen haben vor langer Zeit. Und drüber ein Wasserspiegel, aufgetaucht, ein langer See, eine hohe Halle, ein richtiger Felsdom und das soll ein Möhrige Dom heißen. Und das wär's, ne? Nach 24 Jahren der Erfolg. <lacht> Der optische Beleg endlich. Tja. His jubilance and resulting fame were to be short-lived. Only four years later, tragedy struck. And he was not in a cave, but diving for a film in the Austrian lake 
called Wolfgang Say. An error left him with decompression sickness and left him paraplegic. And even that was not enough to stop him. Engineer Jochen built himself a midget submarine specially designed for underwater caves and with each life support system having triple redundancy. In this he would further extend Blaukoft and find a further two chambers.